morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's session, which is the third webinar in a series of three where we are introducing the basic concepts, concepts of property, commercial property law. Today's session will be focusing on commercial leases. My name is Stephen Smith, and I'm delighted to be joined, as always, by Ian Quayle and my colleague Robert Kelly. Thanks very much, Ian. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks, everyone, and good morning on this sunny day up north in sunny Durham. We've got sunshine and warmth and life is good. Before we start, a massive thank you to Stuart Title for organising these events and for sponsoring them. And just a word uh, in connection with practitioners. I know that local authorities don't have a need frequently for title indemnity policies, but um, from time to time, you may come across situations where you're dealing with a matter and the other side on an acquisition need a policy, or there may be circumstances where you, as a local authority, are contemplating taking out a policy. And again, as far as Stuart Title is concerned, they have some brilliant products. They're really nice people to deal with. They're very friendly and uh, there for you, even just to have a chat about whether a product is required whether, you know, what sort of premium you're looking at, etc. I know Robert Kelly, Stephen Smith and their team are always there to assist with regard to bespoke policies and standard policies. So it's always worth having a look at their website, seeing what they're doing and always worth talking to them if there are problems or issues. So again, big thank you to Stephen and the team for organising today. Lots to talk about. Um, as far as today is concerned, as Stephen mentioned, we're going to be looking at commercial leases. Probably one of my favourite topics in connection with commercial property, to be honest with you. Why? Because you get the chance to sort of participate to an extent in the sort of negotiation, negotiation process when leases are being negotiated and when terms are being prepared. Also, because there's obviously the procedure in connection with uh, drafting the lease, agreeing the lease, if I'm acting for a tenant due diligence exercise with, with regard to the property and then issues associated with assisting clients relating to management issues which might flow when the, once the lease is commenced. So lots to talk about. Again, Stephen has mentioned the notes are available. If anyone has any questions or queries, Stephen will uh, endeavour to sort of transmit them across to me at the end of the presentation. I have a great habit of uh, losing connectivity if there are any difficult questions, but I promise no matter what the question, uh, even if we don't have time to do with it during the actual presentation, I will get back to whoever has raised the question and hopefully provide a sensible answer. We know already about some useful websites. I mentioned to you the city of Property Litigation Association, again, lots of material, including for the purposes of today, a protocol with regard to lease renewal, uh, explaining and providing a framework for dealing with lease renewal and also significantly, I think, for local authorities, providing a list of the sorts of evidence that can be utilised where you're intending to object to an application to extend or a request to extend from a tenant. And then finally, modelcommerciallease.co.uk. I know a lot of local authority lawyers are frantically looking for precedents and to create precedent banks. Uh, and of course, there are resources that can be used but have to be paid for. But I scour the internet quite frequently to see if there are any resources that are free. And modelcommerciallease.co.uk is a great resource for lease precedents. Finally, and again, a bit of a sort of um, blowing my own trumpet here, there is a magazine, a monthly publication called Property Law UK that Stuart Title sponsor, which is a subscription service, but which contains a lot of information useful for commercial property lawyers and residential conveyances too. The May edition is just due to go out this month. So if you have some money in the budget and you want a sort of an, a regular update as to what's happening with regard to commercial property and indeed residential conveyancing issues, then that publication uh, is useful. Thinking about it, um, given this is the last webinar today, I'll try and arrange for anyone that attends today uh, via our colleague at Stuart Title to get a copy of the May edition uh, to you to let you have a look at. So how about that? That's a nice suggestion on a Monday morning. Right, commercial leases. Starting point. Imperative when we're talking to our estates team, when we're dealing with any, any commercial lease that we identify business and commercial needs of those that are instructing us. I am conscious of the fact that when you're working for local authorities, you will come across the whole spectrum of commercial transactions and indeed commercial lease transactions. 
everything from the blue chip tenant that wants a standard form of commercial lease where the rent is astronomical, the details are complicated, and where you're looking at an old fashioned standard form of commercial lease, what I would class as a heavy lease, to a situation where you've got a local parish council that has asked you as a local authority to assist them in drafting a lease for a sort of uh, a woman's group or a slimming club that is sort of utilising the parish hall or the uh, accommodation on a frequent or infrequent basis where there isn't any real revenue generation. It's just a question of ensuring that there's some social benefits sitting behind the transaction. So ascertaining the client objective is important. Getting the deal done, getting the job done is also important. And to that end, I recommend the use of heads of term. Some of your estates department will have their own heads of term that they utilize. If they haven't, then I would urge you to have a look at the RICS model heads of term that are available. They are free to utilize and they do assist in a number of ways. Firstly, in improving the negotiation process, giving you a framework of what to talk about or what your estates department should be talking about. What I would do if I was acting as a local authority lawyer and I've got an estate team that's negotiating <coughs> commercial leases across the spectrum that I've just mentioned, is I would make sure that we had a model heads of term, be it the RICS model or another model, that we use as a framework. And what I'd be saying to my estate team is that I may be able to pre-populate some of the heads of term on the basis of information that I already have about the property involved. So someone sent me an email on Friday where the superior title out of which the lease is being derived is unregistered. And there was an issue with regard to some deeds and documents being missing. And therefore, if a tenant was registering the lease, it would be impossible for the tenant to be registered with an absolute leasehold title. But the point there was that if in the heads of term we explain that issue and say to the tenant, you will be able to register your lease, but you won't be able to register, register it with an absolute title, either we're going to solve the situation there and then in explaining the position or alternatively doing something about it. So it might be that we can voluntarily register the title and the tenant will wait till it's registered and then apply for an absolute leasehold in connection with the new lease. I'm not for the life of me saying when we're using heads of term that we participate in each and every negotiation at each and every stage. I'm simply saying that there are times when our participation early on can identify issues and resolve them without the heads of term being agreed, coming to us and then us having to sort of, in essence, renegotiate them uh, as part of our process in drafting the lease or advising upon it. As far as the RICS heads of term are concerned, they do highlight a number of things. Is our lease going to be business lease code compliant? Our local authority may be business lease code compliant. It may not. To be honest with you, there's no sanction if we are compliant, but we draft leases that are not. It might be necessary for committees or our executive to uh, have to approve heads of term before transactions can progress. Again, we can specify that and again in heads of term look at time scales and time frames we need to describe the demise and provide a lease plan remember if the lease is going to be registered then the lease plan needs to be practiced by 40 compliant we need to identify the vat status of the building as that will have consequences for the tenant and rent and again rent payment dates and indeed other dates i like to specify i hate looking at leases and trying to calculate rent payment dates, break dates, rent review dates by reference to a rent commencement date or the date of the lease. Because from time to time, what you'll find is that the rent commencement date hasn't been inserted or the lease hasn't been dated, in which case we've got a major problem on our hands identifying when the rent payment date is or when the break can be exercised. On rent payment dates, I like the idea of rent being paid monthly purely and simply because if a tenant is a company and the tenant goes into administration, if a rent payment date falls within the administration period, then the rent is an administrative expense, meaning I can, as a landlord, recover it. If, on the other hand, the tenant goes into administration and the rent is paid quarterly, what you'll frequently see an insolvency practitioner do is create the uh, administration so it happens the day after a rent payment date, giving the administrator, in essence, a quarter rent free period to either trade and try and get some cash in or to try and sell the business and do a deal on the lease.
from a cash flow perspective, monthly rent payment dates make sense. A, as a loan authority, we're getting cash in on a monthly basis. B, we resolve that administration problem. And C, we also get a quicker heads up as to where our tenants are in financial difficulty. I'd rather have a tenant who hasn't paid this month's rent that I can jump on, figuratively, in order to uh, get the rent for the next month or to sort things out, rather than for a tenant to be in financial difficulty to hide until the next quarter and then say, look, I can't pay the rent. Other heads of term issue, deduction of title. Uh, again, if the title's registered, fine. If it's free, uh, unregistered, it could be a problem. Um, as far as superior title is concerned, if superior title is subject to charge, we'll need lender's consent. If the superior title is leasehold, we'll need landlord's consent. Consenting to subletting, we might have flexibility. We might want to be quite firm with regard to subletting on the basis that we want to tightly manage the building that we're letting. With tenants' works these days, well, in the good old days, when I used to do a lot of landlord and tenant work, tenants would be paying the, for the works themselves. These days, given the volatility of the marketplace, particularly in the hospitality and retail sectors, it might be that we're contributing to tenants' works or even assisting with regard to works. In either of those situations, it is absolutely essential that we make sure that the cost that we incur is dealt with and that the works are specified because if there is a rent review we might have a situation where the tenant bleats in connection with a rent review where consideration is given to works that are done by a tenant whereas if the landlord's paid for them or dealt with them then surely the landlord is entitled to be credited for those works at review one of the things that's frequently of concern to me and i know local authorities is what we do in connection with generating security in the event of tenant default. And I do know that tenants frequently like the idea of providing a guarantee on the basis that it's a slip of paper that's meaningless and valueless, uh, and tenants will tend to run a mile from rent deposits, particularly startup tenants, particularly relatively inexperienced and new tenants, whose attitude is, rather than paying you a rent deposit, I'd rather use that money for cash flow purposes or for the other funding issues. As far as guarantees are concerned, I always tell local authorities there are two issues. Issue number one, the legal issue. Guarantees are often quite difficult to enforce. So recently I've been looking at a guarantee where there were three guarantors, two guarantors executed the deed, the third one for some reason didn't. The guarantee did not specify that any, any signatories would remain liable even if one signatory hadn't signed the document and therefore there's a potential escape route for guarantee for guarantee tours. Other issues with regard to guarantees, don't be surprised for those acting for guarantee guarantors to suggest that the guarantee is capped both with a financial limit and duration of time. In other words, the guarantee should only be there for security insofar as it's necessary. Um, and the other thing with guarantees is I like as a landlord to see guarantors being separately represented. I don't like the um, the company, for example, or the tenant and the guarantor being represented by the same firm because there's a risk of a conflict of interest. There's a, a risk of a guarantor wriggling and arguing on the basis of enforceability against me as a landlord. Rent deposits, the City of London Law Society Landlord Committee has a model form of rent deposit deed with guidance notes that are attached, which are worth looking at. Other heads of term, break clauses, we should agree these days a break clause should simply require the tenant to provide vacant possession and to uh, pay any payments due to the landlord. Easements and rights need to be clarified. If the lease is to be registered, then easements need to be noted against relevant Serbian titles. Even where the lease is not to be registered, if the easements are not obvious on inspection, but appertain to separate titles, then those easements need to be properly registered in order to protect the tenant. Rent review clauses, your estates department might be traditional and will want old fashioned rent reviews with hypothetical leases and all the assumptions and disregards that create great fun for lawyers. These days, I've got a lot of clients, I talk to a lot of people who say, rather than have a traditional rent review provision, why not just have a fixed increase in rent for two reasons. One, the landlord knows what he's going to get. And two, the amount of time spent on dealing with rent reviews 
and the net result of the review can frequently be disproportionate. In other words, if you as a local authority are getting a rent increase of a thousand pounds a year, but you've had to spend uh, X amount of billable time, both you and your estates department, it probably means that you haven't generated any revenue at all for the local authority in real terms. And therefore having a simpler system would be far better in a lot of cases. Uh, ability to assign, do we make it complex or not? Again, on assignment, you know, can we ask for Argus, et cetera? Well, again, remember the idea of security on assignment is that the landlord on assignment should be in no worse a position than he is with regard to the original tenant. So again, I think some flexibility is required there with regard to security. And subletting, if we're letting a large unit, particularly a large unit for retail, then we should be thinking about subletting or allowing tenants to share facilities and building in provisions that allow both. With regard to subletting, the key issue, however, is controlling the sublease. Is it going to be contracted out of the 54 Act? Are we protecting ourselves with regard to rental on the basis that the subtenancy could generate uh, a precedent or a comparable with regard to rent reviews relating to the head lease? All of these things need addressing. Service and service charge, are we going to be compliant with the RICS uh, service charge code of practice, which, by the way, is subject to review at the moment. The review is in the consultation stage. Repairing obligations, the codes of practice, the business lease code suggests that the tenant should simply be obliged to keep in repair rather than carrying out works that constitute improvement or renewal. As far as alterations are concerned, is there a regime which enables tenants to undertake minor alterations and simply provide landlord with notice and with a, the facility to insist on reinstatement or do we where structural work is necessary or work that could impact on the external appearance of the building require a formal license to be granted relating to those alterations again if there are alterations what happens with regard to rent review user clauses tenants might want wide-ranging user clauses from a landlord's perspective, we might not be too concerned. On the other hand, we might be worried about tenant mixes on retail parks, industrial estates, etc., in which case we might want control. What I would say from a landlord's perspective, however, is as follows. If we have a wide user covenant that the tenant requires, there is a benefit and advantage on rent review on the basis that a wide ranging user covenant will have greater value from a landlord's perspective. On the issue of insurance, uh, again, we should ensure that those that are obliged to repair uh, insure. It might be that there is a requirement for disclosure about premiums, etc., that are paid and commissions that are due with regard to insurance. Dilapidations with unrepresented tenants who are unwilling to pay for uh, schedules of dilapidations, etc., or schedules of condition, rather, better to have uh, something rather than nothing. So with regard to schedules of condition, if I've got a tenant that's saying no or I can't afford it, then I would agree with the tenant that photographs will be taken by my estates team and that they will be a sort of an informal schedule of condition. Where photographs are being taken, and this applies across the board, always make sure that there is a plan showing where photographs are taken from and what they're taken of. Over the years, I've seen lots of arbitrations, uh, mediations and court cases where the courts have been uh, unable to rely on photographs that have been taken on the basis that no one is quite sure what the photographs are taken of, particularly in sort of an informal set setting, which would be where an informal sort of schedule of condition is being produced. And with dilapidations, obviously there are terminal dilapidations. We might be wanting interim dilapidation provision on the basis that there might be issues in disrepair that we want dealing with throughout the term. The RICS code of practice relating to uh, leases highlights some of the points that we've just mentioned. Uh, all of those issues, again, require addressing. And what I would say is the RICS model heads of term and RICS codes of practice are useful as a framework when you're negotiating leases or taking instructions from your estate team. So anything that I can have on my desk that helps me not forget something with regard to negotiation or drafting a lease has to be particularly useful. 
Code of practice for service charge and commercial leases, I've mentioned already, is subject to reform. When that reform is going to take place, I can't tell you, but just be alive to it. Again, it, uh, it suggests for service charge that we should be looking at transparency. We should be looking at openness. We should be looking at teamwork with regard to the service charge that's going to be incorporated within the lease and then the day-to-day -day management of service charge going forward. A number of things really with regard to service charge that we need to be aware of. Service charge is always the recovery of expense that the landlord incurs, so shouldn't be seen as a profit centre. The lease should be contain duality, specialise, spec, uh, specifying the services that are to be provided and enabling the landlord to recover the costs that are incurred. Problem areas that I see with service charge on a regular basis are mixed use schemes. I mentioned this in the past always a nightmare because you can't have a service charge regime that can apply to both satisfactorily the reason for that is that you have in connection with residential leases the obligation to consult with leaseholders statutory rights with regard to reasonableness of service charge etc that you wouldn't have in a commercial lease context so what i always advocate for practitioners is that you have where you've got a mixed use scheme a service charge regime for resi, a service charge regime for commercial, and there could be common expenditure relating to both. The other thing that I think is important relating to service charge is this point that we should be looking at recovery of cost, and the lease should specify or permit recovery of cost. But there is a case called Shire against Colvia Management, which is a high court decision where a high court judge said equity can intervene in connection with service charge. If you as a landlord are obliged to incur an expense, courtesy of the lease, but you're not entitled to recover cost when you look at the lease, you are able to rely on equity. And in those circumstances, the position is that equity intervening will state that a tenant who derives benefit from a cost that a landlord incurs, even though the lease is silent, is obliged to pay a contribution towards that cost. So I'll say that case again, Shah against Colby and management. Very useful case if you've got a bad commercial lease that does not enable a landlord to recover cost, but which imposes on a landlord an obligation to provide services. The lease in detail, very quickly, uh, the British Property Federation has model clauses. We've mentioned the RICS heads of term, and we've also talked about RICS codes of practice. If we are going to be compliant with any of these uh, organizations, entities, or precedents, then we've got to st say so. The spirit of all of these um, provisions and all of these requirements is transparency and inviting tenants to, to have choice with regard to the terms of the lease. Now, here's a tip from an old soldier, really. Um, over the years, I've dealt with lots of situations where I've had an unrepresented tenant on the other side of my desk, or I've had a situation where a tenant doesn't want to incur legals and therefore is saying, well, I'll just deal with the matter myself. In all of those circumstances, if I'm going to be fully code compliant, I'm going to be saying to the tenant, hey, what do you want? And frequently, I've encountered situations where I'm met, where that request is made with silence. And the reason that I've met silence is the tenant doesn't know what he wants. He doesn't know what he can get. He doesn't know what a lease can contain. In those circumstances, I think as a local authority, particularly where we're looking at startups or sort of enterprise encouragement, should have systems in place where we're offering leases to tenants that are tenant friendly. There's a number of different precedents that can be used. There's a precedent called Easy Let, another one called Flexi Lease all have very similar themes. One, they're very tenant friendly with regard to wording. Two, they're very friendly for tenants in their easy in, easy out. As far as rent is concerned, rent, service charge, insurance rent is all combined into a monthly payment. And they're all relatively short in size. So all of these things are designed to give tenants um, a fair crack of the whip with regard to being able to scrutinize the lease and understand what their duties and obligations are within it, rather than a sort of standard form of commercial lease. You could use the city, the city of London, the Law Society's short form of commercial lease, which might fit, but just think about producing leases that are 
very tenant friendly that are readable where a tenant is not getting advice. Be careful as a local authority where you've got, say, a parish council or an associate, an associated or affiliated organization that has a connection with the council that you don't get drawn in to sort of providing assistance to that organization and relevant committees and officers, as well as acting for the landlord local authority too. Leasing detail, I've covered most of this. Rent, I've mentioned, we should specify dates and we should have rents paid monthly. We should not set off and we should be allowed to uh, claim interest. We always need to clarify the VAT position relating to a building and we should look out for the outgoings that the landlord is going to incur to enable those outgoings to be recovered, to specify services, to look at shared facilities when dealing with repair to encourage a schedule of condition, Decoration, particularly in the last year of the term, is it appropriate where a tenant, for example, could extend the lease, where decoration isn't necessary, where we're comfortable that we're going to be able to relet with the building in its current state of decoration, or where we're going to undertake development work ourselves, meaning that decoration and new decoration is superfluous and unnecessary. The location of plant and machinery in a building can have consequences as to its structure. It can also have consequences with regard to noise and nuisance. And again, I've done a lot of work all over the years in connection with green and eco leases. As a local authority, you might from time to time decide or your estates department might de decide that from a marketing perspective, a green and e or eco lease is a useful idea or useful concept. If you go to the University of Cardiff's website, there's a whole raft of precedents with regard to green and eco leases that you can utilize. There's also some guidance about having management regulations that are eco-friendly in connection with e existing buildings. So if your estate team and your environmental team and your committees, etc., are anxious to try and promote the green credentials of your local authority or council, have a look at the sort of idea of green and eco leases. They're quite interesting. The only point I would make and the only warning I would give is that frequently the costs of service charge increase dramatically when you're creating a green and eco lease, particularly in a green building. Things like grey uh, uh, gray water management systems, etc., air conditioning systems that are efficient take a great deal of additional management and thus a great deal of cost. Uh, reinstatement and the obligation to reinstate should obviously belong to the party that is required to insure. Important if the lease specifies that landlord insures, but then an informal arrangement is entered into so that the tenant insures, the lease must be varied. If it isn't, I've seen two court cases now where the court has said, it doesn't matter what the ad hoc arrangement is, the lease said, you, Mr. Landlord, were obliged to insure, you haven't, and therefore you're in breach. Um, the issue of disposal of any reversionary interest requires attention. It might be that tenants want rights of first refusal in those circumstances. As far as assignment is concerned, we may want to have control relating to assignment, and I've mentioned underletting to you already before. Um, this issue of occupation by group companies and management of underlettings, etc., the circumstances have changed. In the past, if I was acting for a landlord, I would be very, very restrictive about who could occupy, about the granting of licenses or licensed arrangements in connection with occupants. These days, I'm far more relaxed. I've got to be, particularly in sort of hospitality and retail, as I've mentioned, or when letting large units. Uh, charging or using a lease for security, again, I'm a little bit more relaxed than ever with regard to that. Interesting point that I'm frequently asked about, probably on a weekly basis. I've got a lease, but I can't get the tenant to register it at the land registry. The first point is, does it matter from a landlord's perspective? And I would say it only matters if you're selling the reversionary interest. From a tenant's perspective, I think it's important that the lease is registered. But from a landlord's perspective, I don't think it's that important. Where it is important, I have seen local authorities suggest that with an unrepresented tenant, the local authority is appointed to act as the attorney for the tenant in connection with registration. For a more informal way of dealing with registration, I have seen landlord solicitors draft the application to register, and I've also seen local authorities and landlords actually pay the registration fee for registering the lease. 
Remember, a commercial lease with a term in excess of seven years or with seven years remaining on the term needs to be registered. A lease with a term of between three and seven years should be noted against the landlord's title. And a lease with a term of less than three years is an overriding interest, meaning it's binding on a buyer of the reversionary interest, even though the lease is not registered. Uh, such a lease does not need to be contained within a deed to be binding, but where that lease cannot be registered, nor can it be noted against the landlord's title, but nonetheless is binding on a buyer for value of the landlord's title. But the important point with regard to registration is where the lease that doesn't need to be registered, nor need to be noted, um, is being dealt with, then there could be easements that benefit the leaseholder, the tenant, but which are not obvious on inspection, but essential for the tenant's business activity, those easements should be noted against relevant servient titles. Uh, other issues with regard to leases, uh, noting of interests in connection with insurance, uh, costs. These days, it's unusual to get a tenant paying all the landlord's costs, but what about the contribution? Be careful about defining key terms in leases, particularly where you're using technical terminology. The RICS Code of Measuring Practice net internal area, for example, is quite a specific definition. Make sure you're aware of it if you're using it. Other issues, we've talked about land registration. We can skip that point. Lease plans being Practice Guide 40 compliant. The production of a plan that is Practice Guide 40 compliant is an expensive exercise. Where the lease is to be registered, the lease plan must be Practice Guide 40 compliant and must also be consistent with the lease itself and do make sure that plans are properly coloured. It's worth talking to your estates team to understand how um, anxious the land registry is to make sure that plans that are submitted to them are Practice Guide 40 compliant and to make sure that the tenant is aware that where a plan is being submitted to the land registry, it might be that the tenant is going to have to pay for that plan on the basis that it will be an expense unless you're able to deal with it internally or your estates department is able to deal with it. Exempt information status, you can ask a tenant to apply for exempt information status where a lease is being registered at the land registry. You can ask that any document that's submitted to the land registry is subject to exempt information status. And if you're acting as a tenant on behalf of a local authority, <coughs> so you're renting some offices from my client in connection with a retail park or an industrial uh, estate, then you can see how generous I've been with other tenants by having a look at other leases that have been registered. So if your, um, uh, your estates team is wanting to rent an industrial unit because of some overspill with regard to staffing or you're refurbing council offices, so you need some temporary accommodation, you're taking a three-year lease, uh, then it may be on that industrial estate that recently a seven or ten year lease has been granted to someone else. Might be interesting to see just what the landlord has agreed in connection with that lease to see how flexible or accommodating the landlord could be with regard to the terms of the lease that your estates department is negotiating. Useful websites we've mentioned before. I want now to talk about business lease renewal. Business lease renewal is an area in itself, and I do courses that last a day, uh, all looking at lease renewal from start to finish. So what we're going to do for the next 20 minutes or so is scamper through a number of issues. The first thing I think with lease renewal and the 54 Act is to determine whether we've got a relevant tenancy. So we have to have a tenancy of a business or business premises. As far as premises are concerned, that will include land. It could also include car parking spaces. The second thing is that what we are, what we require is some form of tenancy, normally a periodic tenancy. The important thing to understand, however, is that where the term does not exceed six months, then the lease will not be protected. However, where you grant a lease for a term of less than six months after a, a, an existing lease, then that six month term can be protected under the 54 Act. So watch out for that. The other point is that frequently to avoid the 54 Act, we will grant licenses. I don't like the use of licenses because the courts are happy to look behind the license to see what the parties actually agreed. So if for all intents and purposes, what we're doing is creating a tenancy, but we're hiding it behind a document that we're describing as a license, bet your life a court or an arbitrator 
will look to see what the parties actually intended. And if there's the slightest hint that the concept of license was used simply to avoid the application of the 54 Act, the courts will say, this isn't a license, this is in fact a tenancy, and if it's a business tenancy, it's 54 Act protected. You've got to be careful about the nature of the occupation, and the important point here is, if it's mixed use, as long as there's a commercial element, the 54 Act will apply. And it's also important to determine who in fact is in occupation and not only who's in occupation but what they're occupying as we'll see in a moment or two when we're talking about negotiating a new lease where the existing lease is 54 Act protected the fact that the tenant is occupying an area greater than which was granted within the lease in the first place would not preclude that area which the tenant is now occupying from being incorporated into the lease in the new lease so determining who's it occupying and what they're occupying, in my view, is important. As far as who is occupying or who a landlord is, remember we can make a Section 40 request under the 54 Act for information about the landlord or tenant. We can do that at any point up to two years before the term date of the tenancy. So a tenant is holding over. We can always make a Section 40 request for information, as we'll see in a moment or two. So, key issues when dealing with lease renewal. Who, what's the identity of the tenant? What's the identity of the landlord? We can make Section 40 requests where we're not sure. What does the lease say? One of the things I always say to practitioners, one of the areas where I see negligence claims arising on a fairly frequent basis, is the lawyer acting for the landlord or tenant doesn't read the lease, doesn't see that there's been deeds of variation, doesn't look at the management file and doesn't get the bigger picture with regard to the landlord leaseholder relationship. That's so important when dealing with lease renewal. How long has the tenant been in occupation? Critical, because where the tenant's been in occupation for a period of 12 years or more, the tenant is entitled to double compensation in the event of the landlord being successful and opposing renewal on the basis of the 54 Act ground for objection. And how long has the landlord owned the reversionary interest? Because if the landlord has owned the reversionary interest for a period in excess of five years, then ground G becomes available as a ground for opposition. So important when dealing with lease renewal, promise me that you'll have a look at the management file, you'll talk to your estate team, and you'll get the bigger picture, the history of the relationship between landlord and tenant. Remember, key time limits. We've got up to two years before the term date to ask for information under a Section 40 request. Between six to 12 months before the term date, we can serve a termination notice or request for a new tenancy. So we've got a six month window, as it were, for the service of those notices. As far as a counter notice is concerned, where a landlord has received a Section 26 notice, there's an obligation on the landlord to serve a counter notice, there is not an obligation on a tenant to serve a counter notice where a landlord has served a section 25 notice uh, offering a new tenancy. They used to be in the old law and that used to catch tenants out on a frequent basis. But these days the tenants don't have to worry about that. Only the landlord has to think where a tenant is serving a section 26 request for a new tenancy of the need to serve a counter notice. As far as the issue of proceedings are concerned, important to note that we can issue proceedings before the term date or the expiry of a notice period in a Section 25 notice or Section 26 request. Important point that where an order is made by a court under the 54 Act, either party can apply for revocation of the order that's made. Very useful if you have an order made as the terms of a new tenancy and either you or the landlord don't like those terms you can apply for revocation. So I've seen that done, where a tenant has sought a new tenancy, been successful, the parties have been unable to agree the terms of a new tenancy, and the tenant has then had imposed on it unfavorable terms, courtesy of court order. In those circumstances, the tenant can apply for revocation of the order within 14 days of the order being made, and significantly, the tenant then can be allocated time to re rehouse itself, uh, before the order bites and the tenancy comes to an end. And the other point to note is if an order is made under the 54 Act, there is a three month period in which the parties must resolve any outstanding issues, in other words, in which the new lease 
must be completed. General issues then, is there a tenancy? Street and Mountford, although a residential case, does highlight the danger of creating or using licenses. The point that I think I want to extract from this slide is, rather than using a license, I would always use an express tenancy at will. On the basis of an express tenancy at will, affords greater protection than a license because a court is always unwilling to look behind an express tenancy at will to see, is this a sham or not? Whereas, as I've mentioned already, the courts are very willing indeed to look behind a license to see whether this is a sham or not. What do we mean by occupation? Well, occupation for business purposes is given a fairly wide interpretation. Just so that you are aware, I've seen a situation where gallops used for racehorses have been business premises and where uh, the tenant was sort of using the land on a fairly infrequent basis was nonetheless less, nonetheless sufficient occupation. And again, I've seen situations where car parking spaces that have been occupied, where rent has been paid, have been uh, occupied for the purposes of the 54 Act for business purposes too. So, general issues, we ask ourselves, does the 54 Act apply? Key elements we've looked at, occupation we've looked at, when does the Act not apply? When we contract out, and we've got a contract out before we enter into an agreement for lease or before we enter into the lease itself, where we contract out, but then the terms of the lease are varied, the courts seem to be saying, well, as long as we have intention that the original parties agreed to contract out, that's sufficient. Some people get a little bit jumpy in circumstances where the terms of the tenancy alter after the lease has been contracted out. The courts don't seem too bothered about that except where the name of the tenant or landlord changes. I've also seen the courts express some concern in circumstances where the, the extent of the demise alters or the term alters, or the, the length of term alters. But generally speaking, I think the key issue with regard to contracting out is have we contracted out before the lease has been completed or the agreement for lease entered into. The Act doesn't apply in connection with licenses, it would not apply in connection with tenancies at will. It does not apply where the term is for less than six months. It also does not apply for service occupation or mining leases. What's the position if a tenant vacates at the term date? Well, if that is the case, there's some interesting points. Firstly, theoretically, any 54 Act protection comes to an end. A tenant can simply vacate as of the term date and therefore lose the protection of the 54 Act and needs to do nothing more. Or the tenant can serve a, no, a Section 27 notice on the landlord, giving three months notice that the term is being brought to an end. I have seen tenants who have been asked to serve notice that expires on the term date. On service of the notice, the tenant can't retract. In other words, the landlord is being given notice that as of the term date, the lease is at an end and the 54 Act protection is lost. As far as the position if the, uh, the tenant wants to vacate, important that the tenant ensures that the landlord is made aware of its intention. So I would always suggest to a tenant that an email or letter is sent to the landlord expressing the tenant's intention to vacate and confirming that its interest in the property comes to an end. The reason for that is if the tenant doesn't do it, just because the premises are empty does not mean the tenant has vacated and does not mean the 54 Act no longer applies. So this can generate a lot of uncertainty for landlords. Whereas if I've got a tenant who's written to me and confirmed that as of the 23rd of uh, May 2022, I am yielding up as required by the lease and confirm that I no longer have any interest in the property and no longer intend to occupy, the property will be empty as of that date. I think that's sufficient. Whereas if the term date is today and that we've just got evidence that the tenants moved out, we could not necessarily conclude successfully that the tenant no longer is 54 Act protected. If the tenant intended to return, if the tenant's vacation is a temporary measure, then that may, it's vacating may not be sufficient to enable us to successfully contend that the tenant is no longer protected. If the tenant is vacating, what about issues associated with costs? Are there outstanding costs issues? Are there uh, interest that's due? Is there rent service charge that's due? Are there outstanding rent reviews? 
all of these issues need uh, dealing with. And I think it's a good idea in leases that you're drafting to include provision whereby you define what vacant possession means. So let's look at some practical issues in regard to lease renewal. I mentioned already management. Have a look at the file, deeds of variation, and see what your management and estates team has to say. I think it's always important when dealing with any aspect of commercial leases to determine what the passing rent is and the market rent is. Where the market rent is significantly lower than the passing rent, and I'm a tenant, it might pay to make an interim rent application. If I'm a landlord and the market rent is significantly greater than passing rent, then it might be worth the landlord making an application for interim rent. As I've mentioned already, it's important to ascertain what the tenant is occupying because if the tenant seeks the court order as to the terms of a new tenancy, the court can take into account what the tenant is occupying rather than what the extent of the demise is as defined by the lease. And when I talk about what the tenant is occupying, I'm also thinking about ancillary rights that the tenant is enjoying. So the lease is silent, but the tenant has had the use of car parking facility the use of toilet or kitchen facilities that are out with the demise. Well, those rights that although are not included in the old lease could become incorporated into the new lease. The court is entitled to do so. And remember, always ascertain on lease renewal, just what are we trying to achieve? If I'm a landlord and I'm going to oppose renewal, then why? If I'm opposing renewal, my estates department need to know that I can't be kite flying. I have to have an intention to uh, redevelop or to take back possession for my own purposes when I serve notice as well as at the point of hearing where a court hearing is necessary. I can change my mind, I can be fluid as to what I want to do, things can change, but I have to have the appropriate intention when I serve notice. Anything that is said to the tenant that is contrary to what the actual intention is can generate claims for misrepresentation. If a tenant is holding over, what do you do? Well, what do your estates department want to do? I would always say regularize the position by the creation of an express formal tenancy at will. Where the tenant is uncooperative, I would terminate tenancy at will and repossess. Where the tenant wants a new lease, I would always suggest that a tenancy at will is entered into to regularize, regularize the position pending completion of a new lease. Interim rent is useful. We can apply for interim rent at the first point that we can issue proceedings. And we have a window of opportunity for claiming interim rent six months either side of the termination date of the lease. Either party can apply for interim rent. And the two things that I think are important relating to interim rent. Where the landlord is not opposing renewal, where the terms of the new tenancy are likely to be the terms of the old tenancy. In other words, the position between the parties isn't changing. Then the interim rent will form the basis of the new rent in connection with the new lease. Where the landlord is opposing renewal or the lease is being altered drastically as a consequence of negotiations or by way of court order, then the interim rent will normally be something akin to a market rent. However, no matter what the basis of calculating the interim rent, the general view is that tenants get a better deal than landlords on an interim rent application. So two things. One, if a lease contains a final day rent review from a landlord's perspective, it might pay to use it. Although it's fair to point out the tenant could scupper a final day rent review by making an interim rent application. And the second thing is, if an interim rent is awarded that is tenant favourable, where you are proceeding towards a hearing to determine the terms of a new tenancy, it's worth bearing in mind that you could apply to vary the interim rent if you're worried that the interim rent will form the basis of the new rent for the new lease and circumstances have changed since the interim rent was negotiated or agreed or ordered. Applications for interim rent then contain two bases of calculation, section 24C, unopposed and no change in market terms, or basis two, where there aren't the provisions of section 24C that would apply. And in those circumstances, the court will look at what is reasonable for the tenant to pay. That sort of highlights the point that I made, that on an interim rent application, 
in connection with section 24D, a tenant has a distinct advantage. I mentioned request for information. The RICS code of practice for commercial leases encourages and promotes transparency. And therefore, nothing wrong with making a request under the code for information. But section 40 of the Landlord and Tenant Act 1954, as I mentioned, enabled an application to be made for information. Timescales, two years up to two years before the term date, where a request is made, the tenant is under an obligation to respond within a month and then is under an obligation for the next six months to advise the landlord if there's any changes to the information that's been provided. And significantly, where the reversionary interest is transferred from the landlord from party A to party B, or the lease is assigned, there is an obligation on the uh, buyer of the reversion or the incoming tenant to comply with any notices. Either if the completion takes place or the assignment takes place within the month period for disclosure, the clock is ticking with regard to the new tenant or new landlord disclosing that information and the six month period for advice on change would also be triggered and therefore the owner of the reversion or the new tenant would be obliged to tell the other party of the change that the assignment or reversionary sale has generated. Responses to section uh, 40 requests for information, important to understand that a breach or non-compliance with timescale will be a breach of statutory duty. I have seen situations where a tenant who failed to comply with the Section 40 request was ultimately threatened with and uh, was subject to proceedings for committal for breach of statutory duty. So it's quite an, a onerous regime that is imposed where a Section 40 request is made. New leases. If you're negotiating new leases, first thing is, what does the client want? Secondly, if you reach agreement, it's imperative that the agreement complies with Section 2 of the 89 Act. And it's also important to note that a court can impose terms on the parties courtesy of Section 32 of the 54 Act. I think it's important that you understand what the court can impose because that, create, that creates your sort of parameters within which you can work when negotiating on the basis that if I don't negotiate the terms appropriately, a court or tribunal could make an order and could order terms that could be as set out by Section 32. In determining what the terms of the tenancy will be, the court can consider a number of issues. What the original lease says, which is always the starting point, the duration of any continuation tenancy, the circumstances of the parties, the landlord's intentions or plans, particularly with regard to redevelopment. So you could have a landlord's break in there, if need be. The relationship between the parties, market conditions. So if the old lease was for a five-year term, and there's evidence to say that current leases of a similar nature are being negotiated with a 15-year term, that might be appropriate for the court to impose a greater term than the five-year term, which was the original lease. Um, state of repair of premises taken into account, tenants' business activity and good estate management is also taken into account. Section 34 deals with rent. You can have rent reviews. You can have the court taking into account COVID and COVID-related issues, as well as sort of standard disregards and considerations. The next point to make note is where you are dealing with rent on renewal and the uh, court is being asked to deal with rent, normally the court will impose an obligation on the parties to appoint a single joint expert. The position is that <coughs> separate experts can be authorised by the court, <coughs> but I think from memory, the value of the rental has to exceed something like £35,000. Uh, if there are separate experts, the courts will want those experts to meet to try and limit issues. And the RICS has a code of practice with regard to what experts can and can't do, assuming the expert is an RICS qualified surveyor. Term length, again, the position with regard to term quite simply is what's the term of the original lease? What is the impact on other terms? what's reasonable and of course the court has a ceiling beyond which it can't go i think that ceiling is 14 years or 15 years and again if we are negotiating a new lease what's the new lease commencement date and what's the term date of the lease again the idea when negotiating new leases or dealing with 
new leases is that the court encourages and indeed promotes the parties trying to agree terms. Question time. I'm going to finish and say, Stephen, if anyone wants to contact uh, Stuart Title with regard to anything that I've said relating to this course and this series, then Robert Kelly and Stuart Title is the person that is business development manager in the England and Wales for Stuart Title. Stephen Smith, of course, is also available too, and Stephen and Robert are both with us. Do have a look at what Stuart Title can offer. They have underwriters that can provide assistance, even where it ultimately is decided that an indemnity policy isn't appropriate. They can provide assistance with regard to decision making. They can generate and create bespoke policies. And where you're dealing with someone on the other side that's thinking about an indemnity policy, then frequently recommending Stuart Title to them as a port of call with regard to a policy that they're going to take out is going to be a useful exercise. Stephen, I'm conscious of time, and uh, what I'd like to do is see if there are any questions, and if there are any questions, we can deal with them. So, Stephen, are there any questions that require attention? Uh, we just have, uh, thanks Ian, yeah, um, just as a reminder everyone, if you do have any questions, please use the questions pane in your control panel, and as Ian says, if we don't get into any questions today, then we will respond in the coming days if you want to send us one uh, directly after the presentation. We just have a, a quick question from Anne, and asks that the Shah case, what was the name of the case, please? So you did you did mention yes. this as an important Shah case earlier. Shah Management is the name of the case. Shah against Colvia Management. If Anne drops me a note, I'll happily sort of provide the citation. But Shah against Colvia Management, High Court decision, I think 2006, 2007, 2008, in that spectrum. But Anne, drop me a note and I'll send you the details. I might, if I'm in a good mood, also send you a brief summary of the case that might help you. Perfect. Thank you, Ian, and thanks, Anne, for that question. Um, Ian, I hope that you. You said there's no such thing as a stupid question. I hope it's not a stupid question on my behalf. But you were talking about rent reviews at the at the start, yeah. and, the, and the idea of fixed rent increases. Yeah. Um, and for, from my point of view, these appear to offer certainty for both certainty for both sides, but they yeah. are quite rare. So is yeah. that simply because it makes the heads of terms more uncompetitive at the time? Yeah. Yeah. It does. Yeah. And you see, in 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 a really buoyant market, Stephen, right, if I'm a landlord, I'm thinking if I'm optimistic, hey, you know, this industrial estate that's 50 percent let at the moment and very unpopular, five, 10 years time might become a real hotbed of industrial activity. And therefore, I can demand higher rents. Now, I think particularly with regard to retail, those days have gone. But, you know, ever the optimist, you know, the, the asset that I've got. I want to try and maximize returns and I don't want to lose out if an upside comes. My view is that if you look at traditional old fashioned rent review provisions in commercial leases, the amount of management time that's necessary if you've got a tenant, particularly a tenant who's dragging his heels a little bit, means that the time and cost that you're incurring there outweighs the reward at the end of the day. So I think there's two points. If you're in a market that's growing, so if you're in warehousing or storage or something like that, you might say, right, I do want additional rent review because the market is so buoyant, demand and availability so limited that when review takes place three years or five years time, there's likely to be a real big upturn and a real upside for me with regard to rent. But I think across the board generally, and, and certainly retail, hospitality, etc., you know, the market is stagnating, declining. And what you've got, Stephen, is, and I'm sure Robert will back me up on, on this, in the good old days, you had landlords and we'd have a queue of tenants. So, you know, if you didn't like the lease I was offering, you're tough. Uh, there'd be another tenant that would do the deal. If you didn't want to pay all my legals, then there's another tenant that will. So in the good old days, you know, we might have five or six tenants screaming at uh, us, to acquire the tenancy of a retail unit in a shopping centre. These days, you know, you might, even in the best of shopping centres, you might have a problem letting. So it's really down to market forces, Stephen. But all I say is, particularly from a local authority perspective, you know, you, you know that there isn't going to be any uh, palaver or hullabaloo about the rent review. You know that your estates team 
isn't going to be taken out of other perhaps more important things to have to deal with it and therefore fixed review makes sense does that make sense Tim? absolutely yeah it's it's, it's just interesting because it's almost like there has been a, a a power shift but it's been purely caused by the market not necessarily absolutely. any clever negotiating or anything yeah. like that yeah yeah, yeah exactly um Excellent. so yeah that, that's the point. And again, with sectors, you know, in the past, I have hard-nosed landlords in that had retail units on the high street, right? And we would have a secure tenants. Nowadays, we might have a charity shop that will come along and say, well, we can't pay you any rent, but we'll pay your insur insurance and we will occupy. And I've got landlords saying, well, any port in a storm, I'd rather do that than have a shop that's empty prone to vandalism that might be difficult for me to insure. So, you know, the tenant just names the price, really. Excellent. Very interesting. Thank you, Ian. Um, we are a bit uh, quiet on the questions front, so I, I suggest we'll wrap it up there, Brilliant. if that's OK. Um, I'd just like to say uh, thank you to Ian and thank you to everyone for attending today's webinar. Um, as Ian has said, if you, if you have any other questions, please contact Ian or myself. Once you leave today's webinar, you will receive an automated message from GoToWebinar and if you respond to this email the replies come directly to me so I can send any questions or feedback on to Ian. You will also receive a separate email in the coming days from my colleague Robert Kelly which will contain slides and notes in today's session and a um, recording of the session as well. So that just leaves me to say on behalf of Stuart Title and Ian Quayle thank you so much for joining us today and have a great rest of your day. Thanks everyone and goodbye.